Let's pray together. Precious God, we thank you so much for bringing us here today together. And Lord, we thank you over and over and over that there is nothing that we can do to be without you, that you will chase us down, that you will light up the dark, and that you will walk through with us through any challenge that life throws our way. God, there's so much comfort in knowing that you have us always. And so right now, we just ask that you turn our hearts and minds to you and that we're ready to learn what you have for us to hear today in this message and that we can learn how to be a light to others for you in this world. God, we love you with all of our hearts and we ask all these things in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Y'all did a good job this morning. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and being here today and giving us the opportunity to be able to worship together. It's a day that our God has given us. It's a special gift. And being able to be here and worship is, is a gift within and of itself. And I thank you for joining us and being part of that. There's an old gospel song that was very popular back in the 1970s when I was a teenager. The words of that song, some of them were very touching. It said, something beautiful, something good, all my confusion he understood. I've always remembered those words that came in that song. Sometimes I need a good dose of that, and sometimes I need a bucket full of it. Apparently, <clears throat> I'm not the only one. Almost all of the great philosophers in life have described truth, love, goodness, hope, and beauty as the five supreme values of life. And the scripture lesson that we are looking at today contains all five of those. It's one of the most beautiful stories that you have in the New Testament. It comes from Matthew 26, beginning with verse 6. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, replied, Why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. And the very next passage that comes right after that one is where Judas agrees to betray Jesus. So Jesus knew exactly what was coming for him. This story of the anointing of Jesus at Bethany is one of the most important stories in the New Testament. And the way we know that is the fact that this story is contained in at least three of the Gospels of the Bible. And a lot of scholars think that it's contained in all four of them, but Luke's version of the anointing of Jesus is so different from the others that some scholars think that it's a very different story that Luke was, t was telling. That may be true. I don't know. I could give you an opinion, but that's all it would be, would be an opinion. However, what we do know is Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that the host of this dinner party was a man named Simon. That would not be a big surprise given that it was one of the most common names in the entire ancient Palestinian world. There were 10 people in the New Testament alone that were called Simon. There's Simon the Sorcerer, Simon the Zealot, Simon of Cyrene, Simon Peter. Those are just four of the 10 that are in the New Testament. The one we are looking at today is one more of them. It's Simon the Leper. Simon was a man <clears throat> who was very well acquainted with the word unclean because according to the law, if a person came within what we would call 50 yards of a, of a leper, they had to start yelling that word to them and they had to start calling out unclean. 
They didn't know why diseases were contagious back then, but they knew that they were contagious. And so leprosy was one of the most dreaded diseases of the ancient world. So lepers had to yell unclean every time that they came anywhere close to another human being. Simon knew what it was like to be shunned. He knew what it was like to be rejected for something that he didn't create and that he couldn't help. But then Simon met Jesus. And Jesus healed Simon of his disease. And Simon was so grateful that he invited Jesus and all of his disciples to come to a dinner party at his house. That alone was a big deal because cooking dinner just for your family was hard work back then. You had to cook over an open fire and most people were poor and so you could usually afford to have just enough food for your family for that night. Deciding that he was going to invite all of these people to come to the house and try to feed them, they were going to have to cook all day long and it was going to take a about the same amount of food that it would take to feed your family for a month. Inviting Jesus and his followers to dinner was a huge and costly act of gratitude, and yet that's not the act of gratitude that everybody really noticed that night. Right after they started eating, this woman showed up with an alabaster jar full of expensive perfume. This wasn't the chief stuff that was made out of olive oil that you bought at the local bazaar. This was pure nard, and pure nard was usually imported from India, and it was extremely expensive. Poor families would save sometimes for years just to buy a small jar of it, and generally they only used it for three things. They would use it to put one drop on a new born baby's head that would give a sense of sweetness and, and it would be a sign that it was a sweet gift from God. They would use one drop to put on the foreheads of a bride and groom at their wedding and then they would use more than a drop to anoint the bodies of their family members when they died. Nard was almost never used for anything except those three things because if you used it up most families would never have enough money to buy another jar of it. In fact, one jar of nard would usually be passed down from generation to generation. They made it go as far as it would go because they might not be able to afford it if it ran out. A jar of nard was a prized possession, but on this particular night while Jesus was eating dinner, this woman showed up with this jar of expensive perfume and she shocked the whole room when she broke it open and poured the whole jar on Jesus' head. We're not sure why this woman did that, but in all probability, Jesus had either done something to save her or he'd done something to save a member of her family. Whatever was the case, what this woman did was an act of spirit-filled stewardship. It was an extraordinary act that showed that true love Love has no limits. True love doesn't count the cost. It never asks how much is too much. It just gives as an act of love and thanksgiving. One of the best pastors of the late 20th and early 21st centuries was a man by the name of J. Howard Olds. He was a United Methodist pastor. He pastored some of the largest churches in Methodist life, but his, his last pastorate was the Brentwood United Methodist Church in Nashville. Howard was known for four things. He was a very fine preacher. He was a good writer. He was a visionary leader, and he was a very humble man. You don't always find that last one with the first three, but in his case, he was very much a humble and gracious individual. After about a year of being at Brentwood Church, they began developing a new vision, and, 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 and as they developed that vision, the church got more and more excited. They presented the entire vision to the church, and goodness knows it was truly ambitious, but it was what the church needed. Brentwood was one of the wealthiest communities around Nashville, and it was a growing community in Nashville, and yet Brentwood Church, which had been a powerhouse church, had fallen into some decline. They couldn't figure out why, so they asked the bishop to send them a pastor 
that had a history of taking churches like theirs and, and rebuilding it. And so they sent J. Howard Olds, and sure enough, he put a vision before the church that was an amazing vision, and the church got very excited about it. Right after he put that vision before the church, Howard was diagnosed with cancer. They did surgery on Howard, and, and they did some aggressive chemotherapy, and it put his cancer into remission for several years. In fact, for long enough for them to fully adopt that vision, and the church started growing, and, and the church was booming again. But then one day, Howard went in for a routine checkup and some blood work, and they did some scans, and they discovered that his cancer had returned, and this time they were not going to be able to do a lot to try to stop it. Howard and his wife called their sons that night, told them what was going on, and then in typical fashion, Howard got up the next morning and he went back to work. Then that night, he did a wedding rehearsal for a young couple that was going to get married over in their church over the weekend. When the rehearsal was over, Howard went home. When he got there, he was shocked to find his two sons sitting in the family room with their mother. One son lived in Louisville, Kentucky. The other lived in Fort Myers, Florida. 24 hours after they gave them that news, both sons were there in Nashville. Howard was, was totally surprised that his boys had showed up there. And he looked at them and he said, Boys, I don't know for sure why you're here, but it's a little too early to, get to collect your inheritance, so you may have wasted a trip. They all laughed, and then his son Wes looked at me and said, Just relax, Dad. We didn't have an agenda. But every time we've ever been in trouble, you and Mom have always been there for us. Even when the trouble was something that we caused, you were there for us, so we decided that we needed to be there for you. At first, Howard started to fuss about them spending all of that money to come there to Nashville just to be there with them in this situation. When he did, his son John looked at me and said, Dad, stop. He said, we need to be here, and you need us to be here. Now stop complaining about how much it cost, and just enjoy having your family together right now. Howard teared up when he said that, and they thoroughly enjoyed the four days that their two boys were able to be there with them. Howard said that it was a gift of presence and love that was one of the best and the most strength-giving gifts that he had ever had in his life. It's strange at how some people react to uh, some of the good gifts that can come their way. For instance, when this woman came and poured all of that expensive perfume on Jesus, Jesus was thrilled with what this woman was doing, but the disciples were infuriated by what she was doing. They couldn't believe that she had wasted all of that perfume on that one anointing. The disciples started yelling at this woman, and they told her that she should have sold that perfume perfume and, and use the money to help the poor. And, and keep in mind, these disciples had been with Jesus for three years. They were being very sincere. They were the called ones. They were the in crowd. They were the best friends that Jesus had. They were going to be the leaders of the Christian movement. They knew exactly how Jesus felt about the poor. So they were felt very sure that this was exactly what they would, what Jesus would want them to say to this woman. And honestly, I'm pretty sure that's what some of us would have said as well because sometimes that's the kind of thing that we say. Back 15 years ago, our church bought 58 acres of land out on North Main Street. We were planning to build some new facilities out there so we could expand our ministries, do some ministries we'd never done before. But then we got into a spat with the town council about selling this piece of property, and so we were never able to build what we wanted to build. And then COVID-19 hit. When we came back from COVID, we were not as large a church as we had been before. So we decided to come back and do a new vision that would be a vision that would be done here at these at this property and there were lots of pieces to that vision. The church seemed to get very excited about it. One piece of that vision was that we would renovate our sanctuary and we would renovate our educational space and we would build a purpose-built children's wing on the second floor of the building over here. We all thought it was a very good idea and we were very excited about doing that. 
But then about a week, maybe two weeks after we put that before the church, I was in my office and I suddenly heard someone out in the hall and they said, Tommy didn't get to build his Taj Mahal on the new land, so now he wants to build something down here so he can have a legacy to leave behind. Well, let me just tell you something, folks. If a renovated building is the only thing that I'm going to be remembered for after 26 years of ministry, then you need to go into that hall and take down my picture that's on the side of that wall with all the other pastors and walk out and throw it in the dumpster and then call somebody else here and get this place started again. Because I am telling you, I do not want to be remembered for building anything except the kingdom of God. I came here in 1997, and not once did it ever occur to me that building a building was something that we needed to do so somebody would remember my name. The only name that I care about you remembering is the name of Jesus, and, and the only thing that I've tried to build here is a place where faith in God is strong and deep and where everybody of, of every race and every nationality can come to this place and they can find a family at this church where, where it's a place where everybody, male, female, young, old, gay, straight, poor, wealthy, I want this to be a place where absolutely everybody is welcome and loved and reborn by the grace of God. I want this to be a place that makes new disciples and sends people into the world as missionaries for the gospel. I want this to be a church that is a shining light for Jesus Christ. I want it to be a church that's known not for the walls that it builds to try to keep people out, but for the bridges that it builds to try to bring everybody in. I want this to be a church that is known for how it loves people and how it tries to include the people that other churches don't even want. I want it to be known for how it challenges the wrongs and how it tries to make all things new and better. And I want it to be a church that other churches look to for leadership and for guidance and for courage as they are going through the rough times. I want this to be a church that's known for what we are for and not what we are against. Against. I want this to be a church that's known for what it gives to the world around us and not what it tries to get out of the world. I want this to be a church that re is remembered for how we responded to the very worst day that this community ever had back in 2007. And I want it to be a place that is known for the way we try to be an answer to the problems rather than just being critical of everything that's around us. And very honestly, I want us to be the kind of church that's criticized by some church because we include women in leadership, because we try to teach children and adults that prejudice against anybody is wrong, because we see science as an ally to faith and not as an enemy to faith. I want this church to be a place that tries to show the world that Jesus is a man who wraps his loving and unconditionally loving arms around the people, and he gives them that never-ending love for ever and ever. That's the legacy that I want to leave at this church. Yes, I think we need to renovate our buildings. If you don't, you had not looked at our carpet lately. <laughs> if you don't, you haven't walked through our buildings lately. We do need to renovate things here, and we'll make no apologies with that. We need to update the things that are around us, but Lord knows I don't want to be remembered for that. I want people to remember that we have tried to show the world the real Jesus. And when they leave this church, I want them to be able to say that their lives were changed by the love of God that they found in this place. I want everybody to have the kind of faith that makes them want to pour the most expensive perfume that the world has to offer onto the head of Jesus Christ. And then to say with the deepest word of thanks, Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul and for giving me the opportunity to make a difference in this world. Yes, 
if we live as a thankful, serving people, we're going to be criticized, just like the woman in this story was criticized. She tried to do something good for Jesus, and, and she was criticized every way in the world. But my hope is that when we are criticized, we are doing such a good thing that it'll make Jesus want to say the same thing about us that he said about that woman. Why are you criticizing this woman for doing such a good thing for me? I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and proclaimed. This woman what she did for Jesus was an act of spirit-filled stewardship. This woman knew the value of offering the best that she had as an act of love and gratitude to a man who had changed her life. She didn't hold anything back. She poured out the very best she had for Jesus because she knew that he was about to be beaten and killed because he had dared to show grace and love to people like her, to prostitutes, to the poor, to the empty, to the voiceless, to the rejected, the ones that most people see as nobodies. Even Matthew didn't see this woman as important enough to actually tell us what her name was. But Jesus knew her name. And he made sure that her gift and her sacrifice was never going to be forgotten. This event occurred 2,000 years ago, and we are still talking about how this woman poured the perfume on Jesus. We're still telling her story, and we're still talking about the legacy of love that she gave to Jesus that day. Spirit-filled stewardship is not just about giving money. It's about giving our best to Jesus because he gave his life for us. The Holy Spirit led this woman to give Jesus the best that she had to give as an act of thanksgiving. She didn't bring Jesus her leftovers. She didn't bring Jesus the last part of her time and her talents and her possessions. This woman gave Jesus the best that she had because he had given her everything. The Greek word for beauty is kalon, and the root meaning of kalon is a calling. God is calling us to claim a beautiful life through the love of that loving grace of God. He's calling us to let Jesus break us open so that we can pour the magnificent fragrance of heaven on the world that he has created and given to us to be stewards of. God is calling us to follow the Holy Spirit, to become spirit-filled stewards of this world. He wants to, us to let the Spirit change us so that we can become something beautiful. He wants us to be so unconcerned of the criticisms that we step out and do whatever we need to do without worrying about what others are thinking. God is calling us to allow him to pour his mercy, his forgiveness, his grace, his hope, his love on our souls because he wants our lives to be beautiful and he wants us to have the courage and the faith to give our best for the kingdom of God. Today, I'm asking you, please, let's give our lives to God today. Let's believe that the best can still be born through the spirit-filled stewardship of God's love. Let's pray together. Holy Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have come to this place to fill our hearts with your grace, that you have come to this place to surround us with the very best that you have to offer, that you have come to this place because there is nowhere you would rather be than be with your family. Help us, O oh Lord, to see you as our family, as the leader of our family, as the father of our family. Help us to want to be more like Jesus every day that we live. Help us to be willing to bring the best that we have to Jesus Christ and to try to make a difference in the world as we go. You are the leader of this planet, Lord, and we are the ones who are called to follow. And you have promised that if we follow and if we serve with you, it will create something beautiful. Make it so today, Lord Jesus, for it's in your name we offer a prayer. Amen.
Holy God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gifts that you bring. We thank you for the love that you offer us. We thank you for the hope that we experience as we come to bring our lives to you and as we meet you in faith. Some of us, Lord, probably need to give our lives to you for the first time. Maybe we have been thinking about it and we've not been sure. Help us to have the courage to be able to say, Lord, I know that I need you in my life. And I'm asking you to come and live within me through your Holy Spirit. Guide my life. Guide my steps. Guide my service. Guide me. Help me to be the person that you would have me be, Lord. Help us all to be the people you would have us be. Help us be the kind of ministers that you call us to be. Help us to try to create the beauty in the world that you want the world to have. We cannot do that alone, Lord, but we can do it by the power of your Holy Spirit. So live within us and live through us and empower us for more than we ever imagined because you are the Lord of life and you can do miracles. Now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen.